Hello, and welcome to another edition of Cultural Conversations with the Big South. I'm your host, Darius Thigpen. We use this time and space to speak with Big South student athletes, coaches, staff, alumni who are committed to equitable outcomes and fighting the good fight in the world. And it's especially great when we have someone who touches on all aspects of what we do, not just having someone who's the athlete, but also on the communication side of it. He's usually not on this end of the mic, but he is the Senior Vice President of Communications with the Baltimore Ravens. He's been in public relations with the NFL since the late 90s, and which came after he was captain on the basketball team and graduated from Winthrop. Uh, Chad Steele joins us. Chad, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks, Darius. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on here. I'm looking forward to this. I, I want to start with uh, one of the more simple questions that everyone gets asked from time to time. How's the family? Well, for your family, <laughs> it's quite the impressive one. It's not quite the same because your father, Gary, the colonel, he broke the color barrier for Army's football team. Your sister, Sage, well-known ESPN Sports Center host. Uh, your grandfather was at West Point, and he served at a time where Black men weren't looked at as equals, not just as contributors, but soldiers. And for every part of it, your family has been incredible as a part of a military family, uh, what you've done for sports. So now when I ask you the question, how's the family? How are things going? Uh, Chad, how do you normally respond to what can be a, a pretty loaded question? <laughs> Uh, you, you know, I, I just I just always say blessed. You, you know, it's it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> growing up, I didn't realize all these things about my grandfather, about my father, and you know, I have uncles that served and and cousins, and uh, it's amazing. It was just a way of life for me, and you know, moving around and doing those things. But uh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to have uh, unbelievable role models, uh, both in life. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, my personal life, my, my professional life, uh, and as a father, um, it's just, and, and, a, and a husband, it's, it's been amazing. So um, I think it took a little while for me to realize, you know, how great it was to have that. You know, a little bit of it was the military discipline. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm a young kid. And yeah, I just want to, I, I just want to screw around a little bit. You know, I just want to sneak out. I want to do those things. But now I realize uh, how important uh, that was and is and, and, and how truly blessed I am to, to have those role models in my life. Well, when you have so many strong role models in your life, there's a lot to live up to. Did you ever feel the pressure to be the best version of yourself as a kid because of how impressive your family is? Oh, I, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, with, with with my father, you know, he's a battalion commander. He's a, he's a leader on post. So for me, um, I, I had to do my part to make sure to not tarnish the steel name. Uh, you know, so it wasn't it wasn't just in athletics. It wasn't just in academics. It was in everyday life. And and, and you, you know, my my father would always say, you know, stands tall, you're steel, you know, and you represent us properly. And so that's what I always had to do. And that's still what I do to this day. That's what I do with our children. And uh, my parents were just here over the weekend. We got to spend some time with them and 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 talking about those times when when I did step a little bit, a little bit out of the path and and uh, what the colonel had to do to, to to reel me back. And those are the things that, that I do with my children. But uh, yes, there's there's a standard to, up, to uphold and, and there still is to this day. You know, even though even though I'm not living under the same roof when I'm at work, uh, when I'm at the grocery store, wherever I am, I'm still representing uh, my father and my grandfather and my sister, and my wife, my kids. I, I'm still representing every steel out there. So I, I have to make sure I uphold myself to that standard. Yeah. Following your father, but then also following in your older sister's footsteps. Um, I always think of how Reggie Miller talks about his older sister, Cheryl, being really the one to drive him to be the best version of himself and get to the NBA. For you, for your older sister, Sage, was it kind of the same relationship where she was blazing a trail and you're kind of following or, or how did how did your relationship go for you two growing up? You know, I, I think as, as young kids, just like with everybody, we, we, we fought as siblings. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I remember we were living in Colorado Springs and I, gosh, I think she was 11 years old or, or maybe a little bit, maybe I was 11. Uh, and we were watching the Denver Broncos and she loved John Elway and the Orange Crush and, and all that. And she said, uh, she says, I want to be a sports anchor. You know, I want to be on ESPN. And we're like, OK, minority female, <laughs> you know, that 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 doesn't fly. 
Uh, and so we said, okay, you know, hey, great. Everybody has dreams. You know, I want to be an astronaut, you know? So it's like, uh, is that going to happen or not? And then she she really put her nose to the grindstone and, and, and knew what it took to get there. And, and me seeing that as a young man, seeing her and saying, hey, this is what I want to do. I'm going to go for it. And for her to actually accomplish it and, and, and be at the top of her game was unbelievable. And so uh, as a younger brother, I was proud. I was also, you know, the jealousy comes in a little bit. And then it's like, okay, well, hey, I, I need to make my mark. Where am I? going to make my mark. Uh, and uh, so that was, it drove me, but I'd say probably four of the best years of my professional life were uh, when I came back full time with the Baltimore Ravens and Sage was with uh, a, a regional television network it was right before she went to ESPN. And we were in the same locker room for four years. And we worked together and we lived, you know, 20 miles away. So this was before I was married and I had a family of my own. So I would always go down there in the off seasons on Saturdays and Sundays and hang out with her kids and eat dinner and, and get a taste of that family life with her. And then work, working with her uh, at the Ravens, you know, she was on our charter when we'd go on team trips, she's in the locker room and she's having to come to me as the younger brother. Hey, I need Ray Lewis. I need Ed Reed. And I, I, I could kind of, kind of deal with things the way I wanted to deal with them at that point. But, uh, those are, those were special years for us to be able to be together. And I know they, they were for her, they were for me, but you know, it was really special for my parents, you know, to have, uh, two, the two of their children in sports and working together was really special. Well, before you got to the league, uh, let's look at your time coming up to the Big South. You get to Winthrop, but before you got there, before you got to being the basketball captain, did you thrive in sports right away? What did that path look like from the time you're a kid to going through high school to learn, uh, lining up, um, winding up at a D1? Yeah, you know, I, I always loved sports growing up and we were always, my dad was was obviously, you know, athletic with his exploits at West Point. My mom was was athletic. And so we, everywhere we went, and that was part of being ingrained in that culture. You know, when you're moving, when you're in, you know, Colorado and Indiana and Greece and Belgium and, you know, Panama and all these places, you got to find a way to ingrain yourself. And sports is a great way to do that. Uh, you get to meet people. So growing up, you know, we swam, uh, we played soccer, we ran track, we, you know, played everything that we could kind of stick our noses in, we would. And um, I wanted to be a football player. I wanted to, to follow in my dad's footsteps. And I really didn't take basketball seriously, probably till my junior year in high school. We got transferred to, uh, to Leavenworth halfway through my junior year. And I wanted to play football. Uh, but at the time, you know, their, their season had already started. So I really didn't have an opportunity to, and they said, Hey, you know, let's, uh, why don't you try playing basketball? So I tried playing and I loved it, really took to it. And, uh, and, you know, was, was lucky enough to, to get an, uh, an offer from Winthrop, but sports were always a massive part of my life. I didn't know if, if I was, if I was good enough or I had the desire to play in college. Uh, but as I got closer, I, I realized, okay, hey, this is, this is something I can, I, I can really try. And, and Winthrop was just a, a great place uh, for me to develop as a, as, as a, as an athlete and as a person. Well, where you are now as a person um, in public relations, in the NFL, it obviously isn't something that you just go from, all right, star basketball player to now being the VP of communication. You had to struggle and go through a, a period of time to get there. So what did that path look like? Graduate, then what? Yeah. It, you know, it, it was hard. I, um, I didn't really know this was a job until my junior year in college. And my head coach got me hooked up with Charlie Dayton, who at the time was the head of communications for the Carolina Panthers. And they were training at our facilities until their stadium was built. Uh, so I went around with them for a day and, uh, and saw what they did, kind of shadowed them. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, I'll, I'll take an internship. And uh, they kind of laughed at me and so they, they had a stack of resumes about this big. Everybody had experience and I really had none. Um, and so I just, oh, okay, well, I got to find something else to do. Uh, and luckily enough, um, uh, some people liked me with, in, in the time that I shadowed them. And right before I left to go home for summer, uh, I got a call and said, hey, why don't you come in and interview for an internship? And um, went in and put together a, a resume with the help of, uh, of a couple seniors uh, at the time, because I didn't have a resume. And it was, you know, I did, I did, um, I did, um, some community service at Burger King. So I was a money handler for major food corporation and, you know, trying to put something on there to, to, to make a resume. 
Uh, and, and luckily enough, I got it. So I did, uh, so I switched my major to marketing and I lost, uh, 12 hours. So, uh, after my junior year, I did that internship, came back, played my senior season. Uh, and after that, uh, I did another training camp internship and then helped out in the Winthrop athletics department until I graduated, uh, in, uh, in, in December. Um, and you know, I, at that time I was like, okay, I'm ready for a season long internship. Uh, and I remember I was sitting in my apartment in, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, waiting for, uh, for that call. And I got a call and um, they said, hey, you did a great job for us, uh, but we think Greg Peterson is a better fit for us right now. And, um, you know, I sat on my bed and cried. I was like, you know, this is something that I really, really want. I realized how badly I wanted it. Uh, and the doors kind of shut in my face. And uh, so I called my parents and uh, told them and, you know, said, hey, I didn't get it. And they were like, okay, well, what did he say you could do to get better? And I was like, what? <laughs> did you ask him what you can do to get better? Did you ask him, you know, where, where the pitfalls are and how you can improve and get stronger? And I was like, no, I just was really upset and I hung up. <laughs> and so, um, so I called back and uh, Bruce said, hey, I'm glad you called back. Um, There's an opportunity, but I wasn't going to give it to you until I knew you really wanted it. And uh, the PR director down there is best friends with the head of, uh, head of PR at the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, and he said he's looking for a training camp intern that could possibly turn into a season long internship. Um, and if you're willing to work for it, I'll stand up on the table for you. Uh, so he stood up on the table for me and uh, I got the training camp internship and then a season long internship uh, at the Ravens, uh, which was fantastic. But then at the end of, at the end of that, uh, there was nothing open. And uh, so I'd made some relationships uh, at ESPN with some producers that I worked with during my intern year. Uh, and I got a, uh, I was a production assistant, got a job as a production assistant on SportsCenter and NBA Tonight, basically sitting in the basement of ESPN and watching games and, and, uh, and, and doing those highlights and cutting them for SportsCenter, uh, which is, it's not what I wanted to do, but it was a job and it was a job in sports. Uh, and it, it was kind of a bridge. The one really cool thing was uh, I was able to do uh, the the Winthrop Big South Championship game, and then um, their subsequent game uh, in the in the NCAA tournament, which was a thrill for me uh, that I, that I was actually assigned to and got to do that. So that that was that was a really cool part of my four months at uh, at ESPN. Uh, but the um, the Carolina Panthers called again and said, "Hey, there are some meetings in New York. There are some jobs coming open. Uh, why don't you come down and um, and, and interview?" I'll, 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 introduce you to the right people, bring your resume, and we'll see what will happen. And I uh, was lucky enough to get a, a, a full-time offer with the San Francisco 49ers, uh, went out there for three years. So that, you know, that kind of started the ball rolling. But, you know, I, for me, I was probably the least, not probably, I was the least qualified person at every turn when I, when I interviewed for a job. Um, but someone stood up on the table for me. You know, someone said, hey, I believe in this young man. And luckily they had those relationships. And so that's what I always talk about is relationship equity. And, you know, those people who who gave me a shot and I worked my butt off for them and they saw that I was that that I that I was good and that I wanted it. And so they were willing to help push me to the next step. Um, so it was a long process, you know, from from the time I graduated. Uh, it was it was shoot uh, two two and a half years uh, before I got my first full time job in the NFL. So it, it was it was hard, but it was it was well worth it. Yeah, and that sounds like such a familiar story uh, for anyone who knows a path of play by play or sports broadcasting in general. You you understand that as well, where it's unpaid internship after unpaid internship. Work hard as you can just to get the opportunity for them to say no. You keep working, and then you finally two, three years later, get that opportunity. Uh, so for you, what, what was it within you that got you ready to go through three years of basically not having regular employment before you finally got that dream job? What, what prepared you for that? Um, well, supportive parents, you know, <laughs> emotionally and financially, <laughs> you know, um, so supportive parents and, and, and always encouraging me and, and really talking to my sister a lot, you know, the, the trials and tribulations that she went through and having to cut her teeth in small markets and being told she's not good enough, uh, being told that she'll never make it, um, being told she's not worth, you know, X amount of dollars or this job and her just keeping grinding, grinding, grinding and me seeing her uh, raise her level and, and really climb in the ladder. And, you know, a lot of therapy sessions with my parents on the phone saying, hey, am I doing the right things? Um, what more can I do? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to make it and them continuing to encourage me. 
and, uh, and, and understanding that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, there are a few times or many times where I probably could have given up and just said, okay, I'm going to take a marketing job somewhere just to make sure I'm, I, I have a paycheck and I'm not making, you know, $4 an hour as an intern. Um, but I would have been miserable and, you know, my life wouldn't have been as, as fulfilling as it is. So, uh, I I'm so thankful to have that support system, uh, in my family to keep on pushing me and, and helping me to understand, um, that the sacrifice will be worth it at the end. You just, you just have to keep on going. Yeah. So now let's take a look at what you do today. Your role is the intermediary between athletes and the media. And you mentioned that word relationship. It's such a big part of what you do, building a relationship with the athletes, with the media that covers the athletes, uh, being the one who kind of controls the narrative. And, and you have a lot of say in how these guys are talked about and how they're covered. And I would just want to know how much does that relationship work? How much does relationship really sit for you um, into your day to day? You know, it, it's it's paramount. You you really can't do anything without it um, because there are there are people that uh, that are smarter than me. People that that that, that probably um, look at a thirty thousand foot view of a situation better than me. Um, but the relationships I have, I think really kind of, kind of give me an edge, uh, because you can be as smart as you want, but if there's not a trust factor between you and somebody, it's, it's really, really hard. Um, and so having those relationships and, you know, I, I, I continue to tell uh, our staff and young people, people that want to get into this is it's hard, you know, because you're dealing with, uh, on any given day during the season, 53, players on the active roster. Then there's another 16 on the practice squad. And then there are 30 coaches. There are hundreds of media members. There are almost 300 people in our organization. So on any given day, you're dealing with hundreds of difference of personalities and everybody wants something different. And, and, and what we need them to do, usually they don't want to do. So it's establishing those relationships and relying on those relationships, particularly in times of struggle and crisis. And, um, you know, the relationships aren't, everybody talks about networking, you know, and for me, networking has a little bit of a negative connotation because it's like, look, I want a relationship with you because I need something from you. And that's what I try to impress upon our people is like, look, when you're talking to a player, when you first meet um, a player, when we have a player come from another team, um, you know, if we have a player come from Kansas City, I say, hey, my name is Chad Steele. I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications. Uh, I am the Ted Cruz in Kansas City. So Ted Cruz is my counterpart in Kansas City who I'm very close with. So immediately that player can say, oh, okay, that's who, that's who it is. They can identify with what my job is. And then I would always call uh, Ted or whoever it is and say, hey, give me something about Darius. Uh, give me a story that'll make him laugh or the, that'll get him to understand that, you know, we have a good relationship and that he can trust me and try to try to try to give them that that story. And when we have young people coming in, you know, introducing ourselves, getting to know them, getting to know where they're from. If there's something in the past that we can connect with, if they're a military brat like like I am or if they love Game of Thrones like our VP does or whatever it is and have relationships outside of football, outside of sports, outside of media, because then they understand that, oh, okay, this is, this, is, this is about communication, this is about us. Because if the, only th if the only thing I'm talking to you about when I see you is what I need from you, well, well why the hell are you gonna wanna be friends with me or work with me? You know, so um, when, when you see things on social media, you know, on Instagram or on SportsCenter, these little things that these guys have, if they have a, a, a football camp for young kids at their college, if they have a baby or, you know, if their alma mater wins, you, you know, a big game or something like that, text them, call them, hey, congratulations, thinking about you, you know, just to make sure they understand that the relationship is not just about what I need from you. It's something that I understand that I care about you. Yeah, yeah, I, I do need you. But I also care about you as, as a person, you know, as a husband, as a father, as a brother, as a professional, um, because when there are hard times, uh, that's going to that's what's going to pull you through. Yeah, building a relationship that's not just transactional, but that actually has a human touch to it. It yes. really sounds like the approach. Paramount. Yeah. Well, for black athletes of a certain generation, there was a time when the media that covered them wasn't using such a humanistic approach. Uh, when you look at the dynamics of the NFL, obviously, it's a majority Black league. You have the relationship building for the athletes who you work with and the media members back in the day. That would have been a much tougher time. You think of 
the men who were breaking the color barrier going back into the 40s and 50s. And when you think about the relationship that the media had with those athletes then and, and compare it to how it is now, from your perspective, how is it that a, a member of, of the media can tell the story of someone if they don't have that relationship, if they don't have someone like a Chad Steele who can bridge the gap from them? Uh, does that does that really control how people look at athletes when the media that covers them doesn't really know them or doesn't have a great relationship with them? It, it really does. And that's why we try as much as we can to bridge that gap. We have uh, in our, um, you know, now with the digital age, we have an online media guide uh, where we have our own communications website that ha that houses everything uh, in our media guide, you know, bio, stats, history, all that sort of thing. We started something a couple of years ago called Evermore, which kind of ties in with the Raven and Edgar Allan Poe, where we have, I think it's 35 questions with these guys and it's all personal questions. You know, we talked about Star Wars, what's your favorite movie? You know, what's your, what's your favorite food? Where's your favorite place to go? We try to think of things and we freshen it up each and every year that we kind of kind of teach them to go behind the face mask and, and, and learn about these young men. And I think that's important because um, if, if a guy drops a pass, if he misses a sack, if he misses a field goal to win the game, it's easy to criticize them. And it's and a lot of times it's their job as a, as a sports media member. But once you get to know them, you get to know them as a person, it's a little bit harder just to go off the cuff and blast them. You know, then you're thinking about a little more uh, this guy as, 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 a, as a human being, as a husband. Um, and so it's hard because um, media, I think, oftentimes generalizes athletes. But athletes generalize media as well so when they get when they when they get crushed by a national media member they're going to take it out on our baltimore sun writer or our local athletic writer so it's incumbent upon us not only to make sure the media understands hey these guys are human beings but it's also incumbent upon us to get the athletes to understand that these men and women who are covering you are human beings they're coming in here to do their jobs to feed their families um, and try to bridge that gap a little bit and um, it's little things here and there. If someone calls and says, hey, I want to talk to J.K. Dobbins about his injury and coming back and what, that, what that'll entail, any little tidbits that I have about J.K. and his rehab and how hard he worked and what he did, where he was, who he talked to, try to give that media member so they get a little bit of an insight. And then you talk to J.K. and say, hey, look, um, you know, this is this is this is where the media members coming from. This is who they've covered. These are the things that they've done in the past. This is how I've worked with them. Um, you can trust this person or you know what? Hey, stay on your guard and, you, you know, just just answer that question. Don't elaborate at all because I don't want them to be able to take advantage. So it's it's a delicate walk to make sure both understand the importance of it and the importance of the respect, um, but also. Uh, the media member has to understand that if if I'm telling JK that this is what the interview is about, this is what the interview has to be about. Because if you try to pull an okie doke, that that uh, chips away at my relationship with JK, you know, and so that's going to affect us going forward. Also with JK, hey, you have to understand this person is coming in to do a job. There may be something that you don't want to be asked. You can simply avoid that question without going back at him. So it's 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 a, it's a dance, you know, with those guys. But it's just you know, it's no different than trying to get my eight year old to eat vegetables. You know, it's just it's just trying to find the find the middle ground where everybody can be happy. Yeah, and it's it's great to hear that. But work is done on both sides to really help bridge that gap. Now when we talk about recognizing humanity in the players and in the media that covers them, one of the biggest things that's going to come up, of course, social issues, political issues, because these are things that never go away. And there is no separation between sports and, and politics or social because it's all a part of every single person's life. Now, diversity, diversity and inclusion is uh, something that we do have a lot more time for as a society now, it feels like post George Floyd, but it hasn't always been that way. So, so for you, where has your career kind of gone in the last five to 10 years, I'll say, with uh, media who didn't necessarily want to ask those personal questions where it's much more relevant now? And of course, now many more athletes feel OK and open and willing to speak up on these issues because they don't feel like they're going to be simply attacked for saying what they feel is an obvious point. How has that balance gone for you over the years? 
You know, it's hard. It, it's it's getting easier, but it's getting harder <laughs> because uh, the media in the past didn't want to ask about it. The players oftentimes wanted to talk about it, but weren't just going to bring it up. Mm-hmm. Um, now, media members ask about it, but the, but oftentimes, unfortunately, they're asking about it with an angle, with a slant to try to get something salacious. So we've got to try to to get our guys to understand the importance of saying things the right way. And that's why, that's where that relationship comes in. You know, we tell our guys, allow us to be the bad guys. If there's something, if I come to you and say, hey, Darius wants to talk to you about uh, the, the, the George Floyd incident, and you don't want to tell me, let me be the bad guy. I'll figure out a way to get you out of it. Maybe we can pivot to another player. Um, but the social issues are, are hard because those are things that are talked about each and every day in the locker room. And there are a lot of feelings, you know, that not everybody feels the same way. So those things can get a little bit heated. Um, and also they have to understand the platform that they have is so impactful that any little thing that they say can be taken and blown up. Um, so with those things, uh, I, uh, I want athletes to talk about that because it's important because they do have a platform and if they're comfortable talking about it maybe that'll get a little bit more conversation going in the nation the things the things that we need but also it has to be done the right way in the respectful way and uh we formed an athlete social justice committee i want to say about six years ago um and it was just things where um, we want to talk to, to our players and say what's, what's important to them. And it wasn't necessarily social justice, it was social impact. Um, because of that, this was well before George Floyd and kneeling and things of that nature. But it was, where do we want to put our foundation money? Our owner uh, wants to invest in the community. Where do, we, where do we want to do that? Well, we want our players to feel that they have an impact and, and we want to see what was important to them. So we brought a committee of probably about seven or eight players together, along with a committee on the, on the executive side. And we worked towards different things to make sure we had an impact in the community. Uh, and then that that continued. And then once things started happening, the kneeling, uh, George Floyd and Colin Kaepernick and those things, those really came to the forefront. And the good thing about it is we had already established that relationship with our players where they understood we were coming from a good place. They were un- they understood that we wanted to be on the right side of history and everything we did. And we had their back so they could be open and honest with us. And we had a lot of very frank uh, conversations, um, a lot of calm conversations, a lot of very heated conversation, a lot of yelling, uh, but it was understanding that we can have an impact. We want to help you make that impact. Uh, uh, and a lot of times that has to be done through the media. And it's our job to make sure that the media does it the right way. Uh, and how can they do it the right way is because we don't give them an opportunity to do it any other way because we are going to have your voice on, uh, on the radio on the airwaves, on a statement, on a letter, something that we sign, it's gonna be your voices because that's what's important. We don't give them the opportunity to, to twist it. So um, I, I think uh, that's that's probably over the last couple of years, one of the things I'm most proud of in, in my career is being able to, to, to impact our players that way. And then also we have a uh, diversity and inclusion um, uh, committee on the business side um, that's kind of the, 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 the pulse and the heartbeat of the business side of the organization and different things that we face. So uh, it's, it's kind of come full circle and it's amazing and it's not slowing down. More, more and more people want to join these committees. More and more people want to have that voice. And it's important because um, the issues that we're facing aren't going anywhere anytime soon. And the more that we can talk about it, the more that we can talk about it together, I think the better we're going to be going forward. Yeah. And you alluded to it in, 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 in that last part that you had the Ravens United video that you put together as a team where players right after Jacob Blake was shot the same summer that George Floyd was killed and speak to what it means to say Black Lives Matter. And that was a great one where you had the team come together, the owner come together, and everyone speak to what was on their mind. And it was it was beautiful to see such an aligned message in that in that um, particular instance. Now, the reality of it is there are going to be many other points where not everyone's on the same page. So when it comes to a topic that comes up that is a little trickier to handle that not everyone agrees on, how do you as an organization go about enabling the, the voices and your players and 
and go, and getting out a message when there's four or five different messages or four or five different approaches that people want to take. Is it that, like you said earlier, going in and having those tough conversations and those tough meetings where it may be some uh, some contentious moments? Yes, absolutely. But that's I think that's the biggest part. And, and, and our owner and our head coach and our GM are adamant about uh, giving our players a platform. And we don't necessarily have to agree to them, but they have the right to speak their mind. And um, if we are going to put something out, if we're going to put that video out, you know, we ask each and every one of those players uh, and our GM and our head coach and our owner, will you take part? And it was yes, absolutely. So um, if there were people that didn't want to, or the owner wasn't, Steve wasn't excited about it, or our head coach wasn't, well, okay, then we'd, then we'd pivot. And um, uh, the statement, very powerful statement that we put out after Jacob Blake and sending a letter to Mitch McConnell trying to call for the, uh, the, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to the, to the floor for a vote. Um, that letter was signed by every single player. And at that time, it was, it, was, it was before our cut down, there were 90 players on our roster, every single player, every single coach, every single executive on the, uh, on the, on the, sport, on the um, social justice committee. Um, so that's something that we can all get behind. If we couldn't, then we wouldn't put a statement out. We would help our players get their message out the right way. Uh, but if there wasn't that consensus to be able to do that, we, we, we wouldn't have put that out as an organization, but we would always give them an opportunity to do everything we could to help them to get their message out, whether we agree with it or not. Now, I, I kind of want to look at the uh, reverse angle for a second now. Now we've talked about the, the players and, and the diversity and inclusion efforts that are being done for the players. I do want to kind of look at the uh, what, what it means for the media to have similar um, things in place with NABJ, NAHJ, and, s- and smaller individual efforts like the Black Play-by-Play Fund. Um, personally, for me, as a play-by-play broadcaster in baseball, didn't see a ton of diversity and inclusion in that realm. I didn't see it a ton when I was at Ohio State covering games. But for the media covering the players, how important is it that they also have diversity, inclusion, and representation for those entities covering the players. It's vitally important because, you know, I I, I think when, when you, when you look around organizations, uh, oftentimes you want to work with people that think like you, that look like you, that are like you, you know, and so when, when we can diversify that workforce, that's important. It's, it's, you know, it's funny, we're talking about it this week that we are going to have uh, players on our team that have played, this is going to be their third year, third or fourth year in the NFL, it's going to be the first time that they're going to have media in, in the locker rooms, they have been shut out for the last couple of years because of COVID. In college, they don't have media in the locker room. You, you, they don't go in there, they just pull them into to a, to a separate room. So we are training them to be ready for that. Uh, men, women, um, you know, large groups are going to be coming in and they, they have to understand uh, that this is the way it, it's, it's going to be going forward. But, uh, but having that diversity, having, that, um, ha- having those people representing is important. And uh, I think our players understand that because uh, a lot of these guys in colleges that they're coming from, particularly colleges in, in, in the South, there just isn't that representation. So it's hard. So having them come here and seeing that, and I, we've even had some comments uh, because we've had many camps and we've had uh, some media availabilities outside and we've had comments from younger guys saying, wow, OK, this is there are a lot of people here and there's a lot of representation. And I hadn't really thought about that too much before that they didn't see that. Uh, particularly in those in, in smaller schools or, 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 or different, you know, directional schools, went through, you, you know, a big South school, those smaller schools, they don't see that. So having them notice that right away uh, is really cool. Now, looking at the, at the career path to get to being that member of the media, we alluded to it, talked to it um, with your own journey, but it, it's, it's very much the same for, for anyone there where, Postgraduate, you're probably going to have a bunch of in, uh, unpaid internships. You're not going to have tons and tons of paid opportunities until you actually make it two or three years down the line. For all of those who can't afford to go through the unpaid internship cycle, do you think that the sports industry does it right? Or is it still a, a steep barrier to entry that probably leaves out uh, a certain number of people? I, you know, God, that's a great question. I, I think there is... Uh, a steep barrier that that excludes people, um, 
but I think it's excluded a lot of times because there are just so many people that want these jobs and there are so few of them. When I, when I was an intern, when I came up to Baltimore for the training camp internship, there were five of us in a training camp internship that were vying for a season long internship. Uh, right now, because of different rules and different things, we don't have training camp internships anymore. We have two season long interns. And so if I was coming up today, there's no way I would be in the NFL just because I didn't have the experience. The people that we have to hire have to have that experience in college or have to have had an internship in the NFL or a professional sport to be able to understand the demands that it takes to, to be in the NFL for a full season. Um, so it, it, it's, it's hard. I think it's competitive. Um, I, I wonder if we are doing enough to prepare people uh, young people for these opportunities. Um, and that's why, you know, myself, like I said, I was, I, I was the least qualified person at every turn and someone took a chance on me. Uh, and I promised them and myself that anytime I got the opportunity, I would do the same. So anytime I get an email or a phone call or a LinkedIn message or whatever it is, I try to respond and try to jump on the phone, jump on a Zoom, talk to them, help them in some way. If I can't try to get someone on our staff to be able to talk to them, um, because again, that representation is important. There's someone that was, maybe if it was, a, it was a former athlete, former basketball player that wanted to get into this. If it's, a, if it's a young minority, if it's a biracial person, if it's a military brat, anything, if they see representation in me, it's an incumbent upon me to help them to, to, to try to reach back and, and pull them up. Um, but it is hard. It's competitive, and you know it's it's for uh, for anything from a from an internship or entry level to a senior vice president job. I mean, it is it is it is a very very hard um, hard business to get into. Um, and and I, I I do I wonder if we're doing enough to to keep that to keep that pipeline going. And that's why every opportunity I and I encourage our. Um, our HR uh, department to, to reach out to schools, job fairs, anything that we can, uh, particularly at the HBC, we have four HBCUs uh, around, around, here, um, around here near us. The representation there is important because that's, that's where we're gonna find, hopefully the next Chad Steele, you know, or the next Darius to be able to do these things. That's where we have to reach. All right. Well, Chad, I really appreciate your time. Um, one thing I love to do here to wrap up these conversations is to mention a charity or an organization uh, that's doing some great work that the guest uh, would like to highlight. Um, I know you, the Ravens, NFL, all have a number of uh, charities and organizations to choose from. Um, kind of putting you on the spot here, but who would you like to highlight? You know, I'd like to highlight, and this is going to sound very self-serving, but the, uh, the, the Ravens Family Foundation, um, you know, the, the work that we do in the community is so important. And our, our, um, our you know, our, our mission statement is to, to win football games, but also to be a positive force in the community. Um, and our players take that very seriously. We take that very seriously. Our owner takes that very seriously. And anything that we can do to invest in, uh, in our community at large, and it's, it's, it's not just in the Baltimore community. If there's need nationwide, we'll address that. But I, I, I think that uh, when, when you keep things uh, when you keep things local and you do things the right way, it's important. And, uh, and in everything our foundation does, they try to do things the right way for that next generation. And then for me, as always, I like to close out with a mention of the Black Play-by-Play -play Broadcaster Grant and Scholarship Fund. Since June 2020, the fund has been set up to help young Black broadcasters as they get their start getting into play-by-play, -play, getting into sports broadcasting, uh, particularly for those who can't afford the unpaid internship route, find out too much of a financial burden, looking to get them going and to get them some guidance and mentorship as well. Well, Chad, thank you, sir, so much. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in to Cultural Conversations with the Big South. We'll catch you next time. Chad, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Darius. Appreciate it.